Oksana, I'm just going to give an introduction to you, just in case, just in case there are a few people who don't know who you are and haven't read anything yet. We will change that tonight, I can guarantee. Um, I call Oksana Zabushka, I call her a truth teller, uh, and people really listen to her. They may not always like what they hear, but they always do listen to her. She is one of Ukraine's leading writers, critics, feminists, thinkers, novelists, poets, commentators, essayists. She's pretty much leading everything. Um, and I'm actually going to use that term public intellectual, which we don't use very often, dare not use very often in the UK, but I think it's permitted in, in many other countries. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about as well. Now, we've, she's published so much, as you heard from Marina as well, and she's also been translated very widely. Now, these two epic novels, which were mentioned just now, first, there was Fieldwork in Ukrainian Sex, which is more or less a set text um, in Ukrainian literature that was published in 1996, and then on the bestseller list for 10 years. And then the Museum of Abandoned Secrets in 2009. Uh, they're both available in English. Now, um, they, when I say epic, I mean epic. They are long and they're absolutely brilliant. Now, thanks to Amazon Crossing, this dazzling collection of stories is published today. It's called Your Ad Could Go Here. As you can see, the, the cover is just gorgeous. Obviously, made to match my room here um, and everything I'm wearing. Um, I don't think that was the intention, but it sort of does. And you can ask, what does Oksana write about? Well, one critic very grandly, very accurately described her themes as national identity and gender issues. She charts women's lives and the history of Ukraine, the very checkered history of Ukraine. But there's so much more, it's very rich, it's deeper, it's darker, it's more playful, more lyrical, and sometimes more mundane because the truth she's telling is about our daily lives. So um, Oksana, welcome. It is truly a joy to have you here. And I've never been to Ukraine, I've never met you, um, but I feel I know you because we've had so much build up to this. Um, we've all been very excited about this event. Um, and I know that you're in Kiev, and I just want to ask our listeners, our viewers, where they are, because we are going to um, put up this poll now. We want to know where are you listening from? So you can see that coming up on your screen. So just tick and we'll see where everybody is. We know there are hundreds of you out there. So let's see what's coming up. And um, just while um, we're going... While well, we're doing that poll, I'm going to mention a couple of other things too. Is that um, you can buy physical copies of this book and you can buy the ebook as well from Amazon.co.uk, and you can find the link in the Zoom chat box. And you can also submit questions for Oksana after our discussion, and those can also go into the Q and A box. Um, and they'll we'll we'll look at those at the end of the uh, of our chat. Also, if you're on social media, please tag at Ukrainian Institute London, at FMCM Associates, and at Amazon Publishing. Now, I think that's the housekeeping notes. <laughs> and, um, there's so much to say. And now I want to actually just finally invite Oksana to talk properly. Oksana, I've got to first of all mention something that strikes me every single time, which are the titles of your books. They are spectacularly good in English. Are they spectacularly good in, in Ukrainian? <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosie, for this brilliant introduction. I, ju I just, um, I, I did not want to interrupt you because it re I really felt like uh, it's my birthday party. So it's like, <laughs> oh, please keep on going. Please I'll keep, keep on, on going, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> more, more, and more. Yeah, thank you very much. We all, we all it's love all being flattered. <laughs> so, thank Oksana, you. tell me about the titles. The titles. Uh, yeah, yeah. I remember the question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so again, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's it's lovely being complimented, you know, by one of your favorite BBC and or women uh, for years. And, uh, yes, we know. We kind of know each other, as though we have never met yet. Um, well, but uh, coming back to the issue of the titles, um, you know, um, generically, I would say I still consider myself a poet. 
So, of course, I do pay attention to how the words collide within a sentence and how they sound in the title. So, this catchy title for me also should be resonating. And yes, um, it should be a kind of a watermark mm. that appears through the text in the process of writing. For me, a book is uh, never ready. I don't dare to talk about it until it introduces itself through the title which may come in the first chapter or in the middle or in the end or afterwards. Well, but it is like, uh, you know, having the thing finally named. Mm. It's, it's great. And it is the title of one of the stories. Now, I'm, I'm not calling them short stories because they're not just short. Um, well, some are, of them are. Yeah, two of them are. are but some of them are, some of them are novellas, more like novellas. Um, and before yeah. we move on, by the way, we've got some interesting um, results from our poll. From We're finding out from where, where people are listening. So uh -huh. we've got, oh, that's interesting. 29% are listening from London. 17% um, generally from the UK, which is great. Um, and from the USA, 17%. Canada as well. Um, Ukraine, 24%. Catching up with London. Okay. <laughs> like, come on, Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> the EU generally has been thrown into one, but the EU, not enough. 9%. More people, we need more people from the EU. So that's pretty interesting. Actually. I wonder uh, what other stands for. I don't know what other stands for. We'll find out maybe by the end. We'll 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 pop in again and see um and see see what what's happening at the end. So mm -hmm. as far as the titles go, um and looking across all the decades of your writing, um and the fact that I said at the beginning you've been charted you've charted uh, Ukraine's history, you've char you've been a very um active participant in contemporary history in Ukraine and of course Ukraine's been through so much um, the last few decades and um, you've also charted for many people um, women's lives. Now are these the the stories I mean these stories are basically about women there are men in them but the women are the stronger characters in all these stories. Um, I feel a bit sorry for the men not a lot but I do. <laughs> A bit sorry and um, the women are extraordinary they're they're anyway we'll talk a little bit more about them but is it is this your family's life your family's history that you're charting as well uh well you know um i don't know i've always um been having a very strong um woman writer's identity if i may describe it this way you know uh because um I think even if I were born uh, a man, and I do insist that it's a privilege to have been born a woman, um, I still, but even if I were born a man, I would have been much more interested in uh, women as a writer, I mean, please don't misunderstand me. Um, as a writer, I would have been much more interested in exploring women just before, uh, because um, women are still uh, under-explored, under under-articulated in literature and in culture, even after this two centuries of wonderful women fiction, women writings uh, in the European tradition, but after all, what is two centuries? Yeah, where do we start with, uh, um, with Madame de Stal, with uh, Sister Brontes, with, with uh, I don't know, uh, but uh, it's not actually such a long tradition, and we still don't know women as well as we know men who have told about themselves everything uh, you know starting with their you know first uh, infantile experience with discovering their penis and ending you know with uh, with all their fears and complexes uh, you know conscious subconscious whatever else 
uh, well, while women still remain um, under toll, under underexplored, yes. And I mean, for me, it, it has, it has always been a challenge, you know, um, a writing challenge, you know, and um, and so uh, I appreciate, you know, this uh, juxtaposition of uh, national and gender because both in national history and in, uh, you know, women's identity issues, um, uh, it is precisely this, uh, this um, you know, dark closets, the abundance of this dark closets and the experience, the amassed experience which has been staying silenced for generations that I find so uh, fascinating, so charming and so privileged to be able to articulate. And the wonderful way that you uh, treat feminism, because I mean, you were a philosopher and a poet to the beginning of your professional career, and it, it, it shows that there's so much thought and kindness in the way you look at women, and also fun too. We've got to remember you're actually a very funny writer, and these stories show you. <laughs> your great gift for satire as well. They're, they're, you know, there's some really, you know, outstanding moments there when you've got to laugh. But um, I can never really mean I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the fact that, you know, if we look back over the 25 years, more or less, since um, field work, um, which is such a great title, of course, um, do you think that an awful lot has changed in your writing, in your, in your life, if you like, your mission and your message as far as feminism goes because, and, and women's writing? Because you've written, you've always written about women. You've been very consistent about that. Yeah, 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 yeah because there's so much to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that you've changed, I mean, has, has your writing changed a lot in 25 years? Uh, has your I, message changed? I don't know, you know, it's, um, hmm. it's a very provocative question to think upon, uh, because uh, um, like you don't reflect upon your own writings this way. After all, it's, uh, it's the job of critics right um and uh yes uh, i sh i i'd rather say that um it's the society and the world around me that has changed in this quarter within this quarter of a century and uh, luckily enough uh, you know certain things uh, that i had to articulate pioneering back in the 90s uh, are now like common places for the next generation. You know, Zabushko's daughters, as they mm -hmm. are dubbed in Ukraine by the critics. Uh, and uh, yes, it's, uh, it's great now uh, to see that you've done something to make this world a better place. Mm. Uh, well, but still, um, I don't know how, whether and to what extent it affects my own writing. Uh, well, I mean, does, does, the uh, fact, does the fact that you are um, such... I don't know, do you see the difference between... I'm just going to jump in there because um, we, we, there obviously, as you can see, there are a few problems with the connection. Um, but I'm just going to ask, ask Oksana whether the fact that she's such a well-known public figure, whether that um, makes her feel a greater responsibility to say, you know, say things that people need to hear because, you know, 25 years ago, okay, you were well-known, but you're not, you weren't such a well-known figure. And now, of course, people listen to you. They write down what you say. They quote you all the time. You're on television a lot and, you know, making lots of comments about what's happening in Ukraine. Um, so you're an important figure for your country. Does that put more pressure on you, or do you enjoy it? Uh, well, it does. Well, this is the part where, but that's another story, Rosie. This is, um, well, the part of any writer's life that does affect his or her writings. Um, because, uh, yes, like you feel you are being watched all the time, and it, uh, 
it does uh, inflict upon you some kind of inner sense for cheap. Uh, but here we come to the issue of this, you know, professional schizophrenia, um, well, whether you write for the audience or whether you write to tell the truth and how actually any writer, you know, struggles to stay with telling the truth and not to get lured by this big temptation being liked being popular and ending up with telling people what they want to hear rather than she feels uh, what needs to be told and uh, that's the major philosophical problem uh, of uh, of the centuries of writings yes. and it, it is just that in this in this crazy information era uh, you know, it acquires sometimes these grotesque shapes uh, that uh, I first tried to deal with in I Milena story. Mm, and uh, that's been, you know, the time of uh, some 20 years ago, you know, when I started, mm, when I was becoming this widely medialized person and I had to develop some modest we went in with the media because all of a sudden you discover that um, that what you write for and uh, how you want to be heard and what you expect you know uh, of the audience all this uh, is uh, is an, a non-issue for the media because uh, for media, you are just, um, you know, a kind of material uh, to to create some Oksana Zabushko of their own. Yes, yes, and which is not a real there. you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, I mean, in the interesting thing about these stories is that they take place and um, they're collected from all over, from from you know various decades as well um and it's it, it is a truly wonderful collection and the great thing is also that even though you're you know you're very well known as a ukrainian writer your voice and your ideas and your writing do speak to all of us and that's a, a great gift i think to be able to write something very specifically ukrainian and then nevertheless for it to be able to to speak to us and i think um, one my favorite story in the book is um it's called i milena and or I Milena, and it's um, people might know this story already. Mm -hmm. I think it's been published before, but it's it, it's all your collected stories really, and it's about a television journalist, which is probably why I like it. And it's about mm -hmm. um, it's about our voracious need for media. It's about how media can eat us up. It's about parallel. Mm -hmm. It's about this this woman who is so absorbed with becoming famous and a media and a media personality that she becomes absorbed into her television set. And it's it's an extraordinary story. It reminded me very much of Angela Carter and as does a lot of your writing. Um, you're uniquely you, but um oh, really? I, it's it's oh, really just, it's wonderful writing. And I wonder um with these stories as well you are you always connect it with very slightly not not in a big kind of hammer kind of way but you connect it with with politics and with history so there's always a hint in every single story of something that's been going on whether in the world or particularly in ukrainian history as well and i wondered whether you feel this need um to always reflect the collective history, the contemporary history of Ukraine into your stories? Is this just something you do naturally or do you just say, okay, I've got this idea for a story, now I'm going to create the fiction around it? What mm. happens first, idea or story? Idea or, or, or fact? Oh, well. Uh, it's such a delicious question, you know. I can I, I can talk uh, 
I can discuss this subject into infinity. Well, but uh, <laughs> to begin with, uh, well, I can't just d drop uh, Angela Carter uh, issue because uh, uh, I, I have to thank you for this observation. Uh, first of all, she is one of my favorites. And, uh, and interestingly, uh, you may not know about this, uh, but uh, I once uh, happened uh, upon a doctoral issue in comparative studies, Oksana Zabushko and Angela Carter. I didn't know. That's amazing. You didn't see? No, I honestly didn't know. No, no. I was just uh, myself thinking. <laughs> so there definitely is. There are two of you girls. Yeah, because <laughs> the author of the thesis was a woman as well. Uh, so if there are two of you, then there definitely must be something about this. And uh, I usually name it the blood group, like, you know, the writers <laughs> of my blood group. Yes. Uh, and yes, Angela Carter is definitely one of them. Uh, well, but coming back to the issue, to this issue of the connection between the private and the political, um, you know, I think it has um, a lot to do with my background. Um, because, uh, yeah, it's uh, a case maybe not just of uh, Ukraine, but of Eastern Europe, of the bloodlands, uh, mm -hmm. to use Timothy Snyder's wonderful definition, uh, where we have too much of overwhelming history per square meter uh, mm -hmm. that still screams uh, for uh, depiction, screams for put, being put down. Uh, and, um, and in the case of Ukraine, uh, we must not forget that yes, uh, since more or less 1933, since uh, this Stalin's war uh, with uh, Ukraine uh, that is known as Holodomor, this man-made famine of 1933 that costed millions of, uh, of lives uh, people in Ukraine. Mm, um, uh, since then, Ukraine has been silenced for three generations deprived of any voice of its own and it's my generation uh, the first generation of independence that has inherited this burden of silence so i um, i've been very much uh, pretty much aware uh, even you know at the beginning of my little career that ours is a 14 brass mission. I have a collection of essays yes. uh, published yes. uh, some 20 years ago entitled Chronicles of 14 Brass. So what 14 Brass did in Hamlet, uh, he cleared uh, the stage of the dead bodies and he uh, took care um, of, of recording of the story. So it's quite a mission, actually, uh, and uh, it's quite a character. And uh, yes, I do believe that it's our generation of Eastern Central European writers that now speaks for, got a chance to speak for the dead, to cover these two or three generations of silence, you know, in one stroke. And if you look now at this Eastern European novel, we can describe it this way, like a separate phenomenon, more or less comparable to how Latin American novel used to be in this, you know, boom generation back in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Sana, that's an absolutely brilliant explanation. And what I thought I'd do just while you're there is, and while we've got a few, uh, I just want to read a very brief paragraph. It's from one of the stories. It's called An Album for Gustav. And again, it's a really, it's a, it's a brilliant way of um, illustrating for people how 
you integrate the the long collective memory of and history of of your you know your own history and the history of the country and you make this um these westerners people like me because this is a story all about a photographer and western journalists coming to ukraine during the revolution during the maidan yeah. and seeing things our way and then the ukrainians in the story are trying to help us see things their way your way uh -huh. it's just it's a, it's a brilliant passage and i marked it here i just want to read it if i may uh -huh. um, it was true a sort of deeper collective memory had come alive in us even for those who weren't aware of it a dam had burst open our horizons fell back and in one instant millions of people discovered themselves to be in possession of knowledge and instincts they never suspected existed of which they had never thought themselves capable perhaps that was the law of history when a nation acts as a single collective soul its collective memory by some incomprehensible means proves to be greater than the sum of its constituent parts um that's just one i mean there are so many things in here i've underlined and would like to read out if possible but um that's that's i think very strong you're you're also saying to us in the west are you not you you don't see ukraine properly <laughs> i mean how how do we see ukraine incorrectly in the west and how should we see ukraine <laughs> uh well um, i don't think actually i'm also right to give advice uh, but from your story, it's quite, from uh, your stories, it's quite clear. I think how we how that you do feel this quite passionately. That um, not in a dogmatic way, but you're trying to show us you have been a democracy. You have got a history. You were part of a much bigger, you know, land. You know, you were part of um, the the Austro-Hungarian empires. You just remind us that you're not just a country that's just been born. Ah, in this sense, yeah, absolutely. Well, but um, but you don't. Uh, these are some things you know for which you don't really need to be a writer. I think it's kind of commonplace now for every Ukrainian going west, uh, you know, to explain these things. That yes, you know, we are an old uh, culture and uh, nation with thousand years old history and, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, but uh, education though of course it is a pain in the neck I have to admit um, uh, well um, uh, we, which might seem exotic to the British yeah to explain to the foreigners uh, well to educate foreigners every time you introduce yourself uh, that you are from Ukraine uh, well you have to serve you know some concise Ukraine's concise history or something like this to express to explain where is that well not anymore so thank God well after 30, after nearly 30 years of independence uh, but um, but there are other things um, you know the more profound level I would say that would call for for this intercultural dialogue especially now uh, when we are all in the same boat uh, mm -hmm. i mean in this crazy world of ours that now is shaking and facing uh, you know the challenges that uh, the west has not been familiar for quite a while and um what really pisses me off, if I may say that in public, may use this expression in public, is how much of this um, Ukraine's uh, dramatic experience stays undemanded both by, uh, by the Ukrainians themselves and by the rest of the world while in fact it can serve the entire humanity mm -hmm. i hope i don't sound too bombastic you know but uh, but uh, but if even even uh, you know if you think about uh, the 
current lockdown like all for all my western friends it's been a big shock mm. like some things that you know the challenge that we're not facing since the world war ii and so on and so forth while for me it's been um something uh, that uh, that i have experienced first in 1986 after chernobyl catastrophe chernobyl, yes. um, in May 1986, Kiev was on kind of improvised lockdown. We were not appearing in the streets uh, uh, for obvious reasons. We were staying uh, incarcerated, so mm. to speak, you know, in our with closed windows. And, uh, and it was, you know, this image of the empty cities uh, with the streets being washed just you know these machines washing the streets all the time mm -hmm. it's been this apocalyptic vision and this sense you know of the world uh, rapidly and dramatically changing and never getting to be the same mm, that yes that that is ukrainian and ukrainian only and that really you know should be shared should have been shared with the other cultures well if, Just, we, if we had you know, if we had time we would um, i mean there, there's there's so much to ask you and um i do want to reassure everybody who's listening and watching by the way that um you your questions will be answered it's just that this is the time i'm talking to um to oksana briefly and then we'll open up to questions very soon i promise but thank you for the questions that are coming coming in um oksana before we do open up to questions uh i do want to talk to you about the actual writing uh process um because we should never forget that beyond all the ideas that you're describing in in your in your writing in your stories and your novels um and in your essays you are the most magical writer and the, there's Thank another you. there's another writer i want to compare you with too which is one of my one, one of my favorites called kate atkinson now, oh, okay. her very first novel also had, had museum in the title, um, the exact title, but um, it had it, everything, the words tumbled out of her. It was, these, there were these long, wonderful winding sentences full of humor, full of love and lyricism and so on as well. And mm -hmm. I just wonder, you obviously love writing, don't you? You just love the process of writing. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm notorious with these long sentences. <laughs> yes. uh, there is yes. definitely an Oksana Zabushko sentence. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that, but I can tell there is. <laughs> It is the term now, you know, in Ukrainian is it? politics and even in Ukrainian media, the Bushko sentence. Yes, so it's, you know, two pages long sentence <laughs> with the digression, with the brackets inside and, and all these kind of things. Uh, well, but you may see uh, that uh, it is the way I am talking as well as I am writing. And... Uh, it is what I myself appreciate in the other people's writings. I love digression. And, and you write in Ukrainian as well, not in Russian. And I know that's a really important... Well, I do write. No, I don't write in Russian. I write in well, Ukrainian. Yeah, in Ukrainian, yeah. Which is, again, it's, you know, for the whole notion of independent Ukraine, it's very important for your, for your readers as well, I think. Uh, no, I mean, it is just... Uh, I don't know. It's just my native language and... Uh, that's you know the tradition where I uh, fell and uh, and actually Russian has been my third language. The second one has been Polish. Uh, Have you ever written in other languages? Uh, well, I um, well you know like everyone who has been born in the language not very popular outside his native her native country. Uh, of course, I had to, and please don't forget that uh, I grew up in the Soviet Union, and uh, yes, uh, the, the inter, uh, entire edu our entire education 
university education was very heavily russified in the 80s when I was studying. So it's been all in Russian. Uh, well, I was writing my diploma in Russian and I, I still can write in Russian. Um, mm. I can write uh, more or less, I can write in Polish, uh, well, but not fiction. Uh, uh, well, and I've even occasionally, uh, you know, I even do some essays in English. Uh, well, but the problem with the articles uh, still remains. Uh, that's something that I have to check always. I have well, to check you know, thankfully, afterwards. Thankfully, Oksana, you have got some wonderful translators as well, too. And one thing, um, I work very closely with with translators, and you've got six translators of these stories, this um, of this book. Your ad could go here. Six yeah. translators, and I know um, a couple yeah. of them worked with you before. Yeah. So I'm going to name the translators as well because they are the ones, and we have to thank for bringing your book to English audiences. Halina Harin, Askold Melinchuk, Nina Murray, Marco Karinik, and Marta Horban. And I think that is also a good moment for us to open up and get some of your questions. Get some of um, the questions that are coming in. And I've got, um, I've got to read them out here. Now, um, let me just check. I'm going to ask you questions which have been sent in, um, Oksana, from your many listeners, all, including India, by the way. We've got somebody listening in India. Oh, okay. 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 Um, <laughs> now we know what stands for other, yeah? Um, there's a very long one about translations, but there you are. Uh, we've, we've talked about that as well. Um, some, uh, there's a Simon, Simon Bradley here who said, I'm currently reading the Museum of Abandoned Secrets and loving the detail about feelings and thoughts from the characters. Do you think that the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, has actually taken his own advice and been reading or rereading this epic work during the lockdown? What could he learn from it? Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Well, yes, that's a kind of a funny story because he did recommend uh, to read uh, Oksana Zabushka's Museum of Abandoned Secrets uh, in, uh, in the lockdown. Uh, I don't, he does not sound to me like a person capable to make through Zabushka's sentence. <laughs> uh, well, but um, it is a kind. Um, you know of a uh, bon ton among Ukrainian politicians uh, to brag that they read Zabushko. Mm. So it is a, a certain kind of, yeah, a certain certificate of being, uh, if not yes. intellectual, but at least sophisticated. Yes. Uh, so. Well, I think that's, that's dealt with that one very, very well. It would be interesting to ask politicians all over the world what they've been reading during lockdown. Um, I don't think many of them can read, um, <laughs> except for, anyway, let's not go there. Um, and so we have another question. We have another question here from, um, from Alina, who's in Donetsk. Um, and Alina says, um, Oksana, do you believe that in the foreseeable future, we'll be able to see uh, the new writing generation dare to discuss the most difficult topics in their writing? Do young Ukrainian authors have the abilities and courage to describe the Russian-Ukrainian conflict and the situation, the revolution of dignity? It's from Donetsk? It's from Donetsk, yeah. The question, the question. from Donetsk, yeah? yeah. Um, well, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm very, um, I'm happy to hear that someone is watching us from Donetsk and also I'm very happy to, uh, to inform uh, the person I misheard the name uh, uh, that uh, we already do have very interesting books, very interesting novels describing uh, this war, at least the beginning of the war from the standpoint of an ordinary uh, Donetsk dweller, uh, uh, a person who, uh, who just lives her own life and all of a sudden some shit starts happening which she can't get and, uh, and how people get involved 
you know, into the war without their own awareness, uh, I can recommend uh, this novel. It is called Dotya in Ukrainian, um, like uh, little daughter or something. Uh, well, it's a nickname uh, of the protagonist, a woman protagonist. And it's a very interesting book. Uh, the author is Tamara Duda, Tamara Boricha Zerne is her pseudonym. A book absolutely worth transla being translated into English because uh, it's not just about, yes, it is important, you know, as a novel about Donetsk and how the war starts, but it, it is also, you know, one of, the, of those rare books that gives this female approach to the uh, war. Uh, it's about women in this hybrid war and how the women, uh, you know, become uh, the prole proletariat of the war. And, of course, and if you think of Svetlana um, Alievich as well, I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely a new, um, um, a new interest, or there should finally be interest in women writing on war. Um, there's, you've got lots of questions, by the way. There's another question here um, about the translation as well. Um, and it's, the question is, um, yeah, as a, flu, as a speaker of English, this is from Roman um, Ivashkiv, um, and Roman is asking, um, as, a, as a speaker of English, do you collaborate with your, with your translators? I mentioned all six translators. Do you ever disagree with some of their choices? Uh, well, yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, well, okay, now it's my turn uh, to say uh, thanks uh, to my wonderful, wonderful translators. And yes, I do deliberate. I do authorize uh, my English translations. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yes, we do discuss, you know, some uh, touching points or something. Uh, well, but uh, but they are really high class professionals. And yes, it took me quite a while, uh, you know, to have found them. And now that I have found them, I'm going to stick. Uh, you know, to them uh, for the rest of my writer's career, because uh, because yes, um, we are we are not always aware of the fact that when we read the work in translation, it's actually the translator's writings and the authors that mm. we read so uh, any book can be destroyed with a poor translation um, no book can be created with a good translation so it does not work uh, you know this vice versa no but poor translation can destroy the uh, even the masterpiece and uh, uh, and that's why this collaboration, this ensemble, this duo uh, between uh, author and translator, who is your first better reader, actually, mm -hmm. and yes, who and is people. and will always be your mm -hmm. best reader, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, I mean, well, it's so important, yeah. So let's love our and, and cherish our translators. Absolutely. 100%, 1000%. Um, and there's the question here about um, from um, Olya Oborska. And Olya is asking, um, what do you think about the Ukrainian feminist community uh, today? Do you think it's as strong as feminism and are you know, women as strong as a community in Ukraine as they were a decade ago? That's what she's asking. Uh, well, I don't think, uh, well, I'm, uh, you know, there are so many, uh, you know, different trends in Ukrainian feminism nowadays, uh, unlike it used to be 20 years ago, uh, that uh, I don't feel competent enough uh, you know, to talk about, I would, I would have uh, rather avoid the term feminism community mm. uh, because uh, well well there are 
there are different trends aspects and uh, to some of them i would subscribe to some of them i wouldn't and uh, and it's a it's an interesting intellectual life that we are and having and it's interesting that you um you know that we talk that i i ask you these questions about feminism so we don't talk about it very much um in the uk anymore you know we just we, we st i think we're very embarrassed by the whole idea of um of being called a feminist you know we, we just are <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's really great that you know i can use terms like feminism with you and public intellectual and these are strong you know positive terms if you think and I, the other thing i wanted to say also because um i think it's really important when we look at these stories is that as a writer about women's lives you don't shy away from anything um uh you know we have everything there we have the the sibling rivalry we have the menopause um you know we have appearance we have um we have death of babies we have abortion we have all these difficult issues but also all these wonderful issues um of women's lives and i wonder also i mean the, the menopause for instance it comes up in no entry to the performance hall after the third bell which is another wonderful mm -hmm. title and you explore motherhood as well um, but the way you do it is is not just you write a story about a woman you actually write it as a fairy tale or as a as some kind of mythology and i wonder also are you in any way by doing that are you um trying to not judge people you're just telling the story you're letting the story speak for itself you don't make a moral no. judgment no i don't no i try not to i try not to i mean i don't think it's a writer's business and uh, i'm afraid of moral judgments altogether i mean uh, none of us is a priest yeah um so um it is um it is rather about learning from life you know that mm -hmm. then telling life uh, how it should develop itself no no let's let's Mm, let's trust life you know and then the things will show up and that's uh, you know the part which uh, i think is most precious about writing when the story starts shaping itself in fact i never know when when i start whenever i start the story uh, i imagine only very vaguely you know what happened what uh, is going on uh, but uh, i'm uh, i write to find out how it happened and it is precisely this curiosity that is the strong that makes the strongest motivation mm -hmm. driving me through the story and when it starts getting changed and reshaped somewhere in the middle uh, now you know that you really touched some nerve of the reality which uh, which can't be faked can't be falsified oksana we have we are visiting you tonight in your home and i know that a lot of your uh, readers and also i would like to know how you are coping with this situation um the moment um the pandemic the the lockdown you spoke earlier about having experienced lockdown through Chernobyl through that time in 1986. Um, but this is, this is, again, it's different. We're all going through this together. Is this, um, as it is for some writers, is this a creative yeah. time for you? Or is this, a, is this what, what, how would you describe your life at the moment? Mm, I can't say change too much because, well, writers work from home you know and i'm quite comfortable about working from home uh, so it is more or less like it used to be uh, minus social life of course and uh, you know minus um, well some important things from my schedule like for instance uh, the three weeks uh, book tour over the united states with this same book 
for which I feel really sorry because it's been so meticulously pre-planned, prepared uh, by the publisher and the, the whole group of organizers. And there are so many people involved into it. It's like an enterprise, you know, so I was supposed to cover the whole the, the United States from Boston to California and uh, and it's been uh, you know so well so many appointments and so many interesting meetings scheduled uh, and uh, all this uh, vanished uh, like how you know uh, within a moment and that's something that's a challenge you know the challenge is that we owe this you know, leaving connections with uh, the people. Like now we are talking to each other. Uh, we actually are talking to, to the screen, yeah? Mm. To each other's images on this screen. And it is kind of, you know, gory if you think about I'm it. I'm sure that you'll write a short story about it. <laughs> <laughs> One day I might. You might. One day I might, yeah. Are, but are, you, are you writing at the moment though? Are you writing? Uh, well, uh, I'm I'm preparing to finally uh, uh, my novel in process, of which I'm afraid I don't have time anymore to to tell you. Uh, okay, next time. Next uh, time. Well, don't worry. I think, um, <laughs> I have to. <laughs> that, that's okay. We'll, we'll definitely talk about that, but but also, I mean, just on the on very final question because this is something that um, Yulia um, Klimko of um, Ovochenko has asked as well. Is that you know what do you think is going to happen? This is a big question, of course, can't be answered quickly, but maybe it can. You know, what do you think is going to happen to the world after the pandemic? Now, one thing that I find really really fascinating reading your book, um, you spoke about the mass gatherings that took place, the demonstrations, the revolutions that took place in Ukraine and across you know, Eastern Europe and various other places I went to as well as a journalist, those mass gatherings couldn't happen now. There couldn't be revolutions. Is this the end for revolutions? What's gonna happen? Well, we, we don't know what kind of the world uh, is in store for us. Uh, for now, we can only say that uh, it's been a big challenge for the whole concept of globalization. Uh, uh, because uh, we ended up in our caves, incarcerated in our caves with this, you know, primordial instinct of fear that makes every animal to crawl into her cave. And, um, and yes, uh, well, I don't know about revolutions. I, even though my new novel is about Cassandra and the Trojan War, another women's prospect of the war. I'm thinking Margaret Atwood, um, Krista Wolf already, you know, so many, that's fantastic, how exciting. Let's Lesya Ukrainka, she was the first woman in European tradition. Again, you know why Why you need more Ukrainian writers, classics included, uh, translated into English. She had a wonderful, wonderful play um, written before the World War I, uh, Cassandra, about this, uh, you know, women's uh, vision, intellectual, um, intellectual foreseeing the war ripening and approaching and being totally helpless to do anything. So wow. that's, that's her. Cassandra mine is going to be different, but, uh, but anyway, I mean, uh, prophecies, with the prophecies, we are always, you know, in a, in a, in a difficult position, but the thing is that yes, the world is uh, changing right now. And uh, we are, always, um, you know, a little bit behind the changes in our own awareness. Oksana, um, we have to end it there. It's been an absolute pleasure, incredible. I've been so looking forward to meeting you. This is a real meeting, even if it's only a virtual meeting. And I'm sure that the, the hundreds of people listening around the world will also want to express their gratitude to you.